I was listening to Radio Cornwall this morning and there was a lovely Cornish lady on, 93, same age as me, who is still, I'm not sure she's living alone, but she's still looking after herself, doing the gardening, doing the cooking, doing her work. And uh, they asked her how she managed. And she said, well, she said, I've got millions of friends and good health and I love gardening and you've got to keep going. And I thought, what a lovely philosophy. But when you've had a stroke, it's not so easy to keep going. If I'd had it at home, I presume, no knowledge whatsoever, I would have collapsed. I can't think what else would have happened. I went upstairs, <coughs> we were going to bed, and I remember I wanted to go to the bathroom and was sort of wiggling, sat on a chair, and this is a funny thing, Alan. There was, I could, over my bed at David's in the big house, I could see myself. There was my face with a, I won't say, oh, with a vacant look. And I remember thinking, what a stupid expression. I can see myself as clearly as if it was yesterday. Just the face looking completely vacant, most peculiar. I was aware of this sensation, but uh, Oh, since then, you know, I do go over it a bit sometimes. I wasn't a bit scared. I just looked so stupid. As if I'd had a big mirror up and there was this old lady sort of, well, just, you know, I thought, how stupid, say something. And uh, Kevin, David's friend, came up the stairs and David immediately, Kevin went and dialed 999. Uh, David put his arm around me. It's all right, darling, it's all right. Stay with us, stay with us. And I was going, oh. I can remember this awful, awful noise coming out of my mouth. But I couldn't get over the expression. Just before we got to the hospital, <laughs> apparently, I came to my usual nosy self and was interrogating the <laughs> paramedic. Was he married? How many children? Where did he live? <laughs> and he said, oh, I'm so glad you're back with us. And, you know, it happened so quickly. I can't get over how lucky I am. And you must go and see the kitchen. It's lovely. And upstairs, which is full of clutter, I must say at the moment. I mean, I've got clothes in there. I wore before Hugh died in 82. This was a couple of old garages. I've been in this garage with David while he's been fiddling about with an old Morris Minor and whatnot. And he decided to have them converted into a, well, an apartment, I suppose. I think it's posh enough to be called an apartment. And uh, uh, not specially for Gwenda, but that in the back of his mind for when I couldn't cope at Sturter. So he said, well, it will add you know, value to the property. So hence, these two were converted, I would think about a couple of years ago, if not more. And I know when I came over, and uh, it really, you know, was nice. I used to feel terribly guilty. And I used to say to David, well, you could let it out for holiday people. Oh no, he said, I wouldn't want that. And I do remember saying to him, he said, you're not going to go into a home. And I remember saying, well, 
I might like to go to a home and see if there's some n nice old men there. He always used to say, you will know when the time has come. So I was still able to live comfortably, very comfortably, with the help of David and Betty and lovely friends, you know, to stay at Starter. And then staying here at the beginning of November uh, with David and suddenly life alters and you're slightly disabled. <laughs> I said, oh, David, can't we have a stanner lift? No, he said, have a hospital bed, then you come. And they brought over my television, which of course has got this audio description, which with this macular uh, degeneration, which I can't see very well, it's like listening to a story. The carers, I've had so many, and they've all been young and middle-aged, and they've all, as soon as they've come in, I say, oh, isn't this lovely? And I mean, of course, it is. It's like, you know, it's so big to me, like some people's houses could go in this uh, apartment. <laughs> and David lives next door, yes. So it's just across the little terrace, and um, if I want him, we've got a lifeline, and also um, I just dial, and normally I try not to worry him ever, but uh, usually if I got tangled up with the ox, oxygen or some minor thing, you know, I'll be over straight away. <laughs> so. Yeah, there's that security, which is nice. And uh, he said to me the other day, are you happy? And I said, David, how couldn't I be happy here? It's absolutely beautiful. And uh, I said, you know, if there are some irritating things about me, <laughs> which I'm unaware of, apart from talking too much, but that sort of... Uh, has helped now because of the lack of oxygen, yeah. so I can't do so much. And I said, you must tell me. And he said, well, and it goes for me too. And we looked at each other, we just roared with laughter and said, can't think of anything. <laughs> and it's nice, you know, I don't want to affect his life in any way. After all, he's only 60. and. Uh, you know, no blood relation, it's absolutely marvellous what he's done. And I do thoroughly appreciate it. Three lovely dogs of David's, Olive, Heidi and Colin, who are a joy. Two pussycats, Tabitha and Turvy. Three geese, cockerels, Morse, Lewis and Hathaway. I think most stroke victims would say the same. Uh, one day you're fine and doing all the things you've done for, well, not quite all the things you've done for years. And then suddenly you wake up in the hospital and you can't move your right leg and you're calling for a bedpan. I really felt I ought to have made a fortune on inventing a new bedpan. <laughs>